Hi folks, this is uh, Richard here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and I've also got Kay with me. Hello okay. everybody. <laughs> okay, and this is the night sky. Now, um, there you are, look at that beautiful night sky that you can see there. And uh, all underneath it of course is Stonehenge and I said that we're from Stonehenge, which we are, uh, but I thought today what we'd do is actually talk about Stonehenge, it's a links and how it came to be built in the first place, all right? Um, because it is, it is uh, the stone circle itself is our ancestors link between the earth, their way of life and the stars above them. So let's have a brief sort of look what that's all about. Uh, both Kay and I used to work at Carter Observatory in Wellington and we used to run a series of courses and one of them was called Legends and Mysteries of the Night Sky and we found that people were absolutely fascinated with stone circles and pyramids. So we always said if we ever have the opportunity one day we should build one but a working one so that people could come out and see how these ancient technologies work. And that came out with the up with the Royal Society who put up the money and then we along with members from the Phoenix Astronomical Society and so on managed to find people all around the country who were interested in building it and we ended up with some of the top people didn't we Kay? Yeah yeah, yeah. very skilled people. Now a lot of people because we use the word Stonehenge thought we were building a replica of what was on Salisbury Plain well, that was never our intention for two reasons. Number one, the word Stonehenge is actually a generic name for stone circles which have got lintels on them. Uh, those, those, those bits laying along the top there. And as well as that famous one that's in Britain, which some of you can see if you're watching it on TV, there's also another Stonehenge in uh, Russia, another one in Bulgaria, and so on and so forth. And then quite a few imitations of Stonehenge, England. Yeah. The one we think of in Salisbury Plain, made out of different things, yeah. like um, Cadillacs and stuff in America. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. So, but uh, where is that, uh, that stone circle, the one on Salisbury Plain, is ancient. It goes back about four and a half thousand years. It's actually one of the last gate stone circles to be built. We're finding them in Mesopotamia now, going back more than uh, 12,000 years in time. Right. And we find these stone circles of, around the world and they've been making some amazing discoveries about them just of recent times. Actually, in many cases, from DNA that was, was left on the stones thousands of years ago. Yeah. First of all, the people who built it, who were they? Well, it turns out that most, if not all of them, all the stone circles were built by hunter-gatherers. So they predate what you would call civilization. Right? Furthermore, we also know that they were a meeting place of tribes. And because people were meeting there, after a while people began to settle in the area, and that gave rise to the very first permanent settlements. So what historians are saying now, these stone circles were the starting points of civilization. And looking at the stones themselves, uh, for those of you looking at the picture of a recreation of Stonehenge thousands of years ago. Not quite right because we do now know that the stone circle was actually painted and um, there at the moment archaeologists are trying to find the evidence and get work out what the patterns were that were on there and so on. Okay? Evidently they can even though you can't see anything they can pick up little traces of chemicals that have been because most of the time I mean it's not like a modern paint it's a it's an ochre of something. Yeah. Yeah. It's just been absorbed by the stone, but they, you know, mm, and that's it's amazing. It. So right? there's been, going to be some fantastic things to be discovered once yeah. they work out those patterns. So we just don't know how much of it was painted either. And also, a suggestion I mentioned it is that different stones were placed by and represented different tribes, and that's why it was a meeting place. Is where all the tribes came. Some together. of that's based on the um, the chalk. The chalk holes, isn't they? Holes filled with chalk where they found bones there, and those bones belong to different individuals. That's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it is, like everything in archaeology, it's the best guess to first fit the evidence that you've At got, moment, and it yeah. could, be, could be altered a little bit, you know? Yeah. But you see, one of the fascinating things for me at the beginning was I began to look at stone circles and amazingly, they've got all these precise astronomical alignments. And yeah. um, 
which is what we're, well guess where we came into thought we, we would build it now first of all what they're all about well we we're pretty certain at the center there's a sort of temple area all right in each stone circle and what historians are saying is that those ancient religions played a, a major role also in the rise of civilization now you've all heard of cavemen and cave women yeah and that's undoubtedly because those wonderful cave paintings that you're found in europe <coughs> and <coughs> but in actual fact in most cases there's absolutely no evidence of human habitation in those caves oh and if it is it's right at the surface yeah. right close to the entrance yeah whereas these things are deep down that's right at enormous depths and like they're quite large caverns usually where they're I mean, not always, but quite often, like you can see in this one, it's a reasonably large cavern. That, and it almost looks like a ring of stone with a, a, a higher bit in the middle, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. Mm. Now, but the interesting thing, how this has all changed, is just recently, out in Mesopotamia, uh, on a temple that had been buried underneath sand for about 10,000 years, uh, when they got, it, got up, uncovered it and got into the temple, the paintings on the wall inside were virtually identical to what is found on, on caves. And this has changed our thoughts about it. So what historians think now, these caves with paintings, they weren't living quarters of people. These were in fact the very first temples on earth, possibly the temples to Mother Earth or something like that. So what we're looking at is something, as I say, it's an I ancient think religion. We tend to divide our world into subjects, you know, we say you go to church and that's religion. You go um, into a laboratory and play with lots of bits and pieces and sophisticated equipment and that's science. You go somewhere else and, you know, you're looking at, at mountains and stuff and that's geology. These people didn't do that. It was their life. Mm. And most important thing about their life was staying alive. Mm, absolutely. And I think this is the whole thing of when we're looking into the distant past, we tend to forget the difference between the knowledge that was there today and what it was in the past. Now, okay, so we know that, 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 uh, that this is a meeting place. And what, why did the religion play an important role? Well, the answer is, what they say is it gave us a moral and ethical code by which we could live together. So you're not going to pinch my sheep and I won't pinch yours. And this also meant that when the different tribes came together, they knew what the rules were. So they didn't end up fighting each other. Okay? So that was the importance of the early religions because the rules were set by the gods or God, not by the chieftains. And it was above the chieftains. And that's why it was so important, that code that we lived Did by. Did you find... The same sort of code. If you look, if you look into the way Maori society still would like to function, you know, if you if you follow their um, way of looking at it, then the you have various ideas or whatever else. But it's in the doing of working together that the real um, culture oh, takes shape well look you look at everything and that's the being. same with these people they were coming in from all over the place and it was the doing together yeah. and it was it, people said to me how on earth did those those primitive people pull those gigantic stones into I don't place i think they were primitive <laughs> i mean they well, didn't have the tools we have but if you are talking about um, thought processes are meant to all primitive. It was teamwork. It's people yeah. working together in And there would have been numbers. Einsteins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but like what we call Einsteins now, always. Yeah. There were people who were and human incredible. Beings, it's what we create as a team together. That's what it's all about, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, uh, we tend to forget... All that information, I often say when people come out to Stonehenge, I've got a room full of people, I say, OK, let's just test things. If there were no roads and no maps, would you know how to get to Auckland from here? And then suddenly people realise, actually, no, I wouldn't, you see. But our ancestors navigated their way around the world thousands of years ago. Another question, OK, if there was no such thing as you'd never seen a calendar, would you know what month we we're in? Certainly not at the moment with the weather, the way it changes. Well, a, a little while back, not too far away, I can remember how, how at Stonehenge we had one day, it was roasting hot like the middle of summer, and the next day we had snow up on the Tararuas. It went from summer to winter overnight. But you see, this information, which 
we just take for granted these days was a matter of life and death for our ancestors because if you planted at the wrong time you never came back all right yeah because, you couldn't couldn't get a replacement unless you raided somebody else yeah, yeah. and so if you planted at the wrong time there's a damn good chance your crop would fail and uh, there was no one to bail you out in those days all right and so knowing that when to carry out a different task was all important all right um when to sail was another important thing if you sailed at the wrong time of the year you never came back well how did they know exactly when to do all these things well the answer is the stars and from going way way back to the earliest of times we know our ancestors have been using the sun the moon and the stars which would tell them what was going to happen in the future. And it doesn't matter where you come from in the world, you'll find the same thing. That's right, yeah. The signs in the sky, okay? When people come out to Stonehenge and we're teaching them in astronomy, one of the things we often do is pick out the constellations. That's the pattern the stars form. And people often get quite bewildered that the pattern of the constellation appears to bear very little resemblance to the figure. In other words, you've got to use a lot of imagination to see a whale up there or a bear or whatever it's supposed to be. Now, there's a good reason for that. Those ancient constellations, I do mean ancient, the names of many of those constellations come back from thousands of years ago. They're not so named because they look like something, they were named because of their symbolism. Now, for those of you on TV, I'm going to bring up a very famous constellation. It comes up now, Aquarius. All right, a man pouring water out of a bucket. So called, not because it looks like a man pouring water out of a bucket, it's actually supposed to be God. It's when those stars rose up in the dawn 5,000 years ago, it heralded the onset of the rainy season. God was about to pour water down on the earth. Which felt like God pouring water on your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, another one I just brought bring up now, Leo the Lion. Again so called, not because it looks like a lion in the sky, but when those stars rose up in the dawn 5,000 years ago, in the northern hemisphere it was the near the hottest time of the year. And at that time, the, along the Nile Valley, the lions would begin to come in from the wilderness and would prey upon the domestic flocks. It was a warning, the lions are coming. And so if you look up there, there's all these different animals and birds, and they're not just things. What you'll discover, if you go backwards in time, you'll discover when those stars rose up in the dawn thousands of years ago, lo and behold, that species would migrate into the area and so on. Right? So this is what they was, were looking at. Um, it was an encyclopedia in the sky. Yeah. Yeah, now this all works because as we orbit around the sun, we experience the same seasons in the same part of the Earth's orbit. The orbit, the tilt of the Earth's axis is the, the cause of the seasons we have. So right now in January, December, January, February, we're at maximum tilt towards the, the southern hemisphere is at maximum tilt towards the sun. It's our summer, we have the longest hours of daylight. The northern hemisphere is tilted away, it's their winter, short hours. And when we look out at night, we see the stars in a certain direction. Six months later, we're on the opposite side of the sun. And because the Earth has maintained that tilt in the same direction, all the conditions are now reversed. It's summer in the northern hemisphere, winter in the south. And we can't see the, the stars that we could see in our summer because on the, on the, on the other side of the sun. So every season, every month of the year has got its own pageant of stars rising up in the morning sky. So for example, folks, if you got up early tomorrow morning or, or tonight went out and timed exactly what time a star rose or set and did exactly the same thing from the same spot the following evening you'd find that star would rise or set four minutes earlier than it did the night before and that is due to the motion of the earth around the sun now our ancestors didn't know anything about the earth going around the sun but what they did realize is hey when that star rose up that was going to happen down here and indeed after a while, the, the uh, concept began to arise from them that it was the stars themselves which were 
causing these things to occur. And this is where you get the origin of astrology, the belief that the stars were influencing things down here on Earth. Right? Or the other thought was that they were the messengers of the gods. All right. So you can see that as the for those who look on TV, as the Earth goes around the Sun, we can experience those different seasons. Okay, now, so that's happening all the time. Now in the ancient world, there were four special days which marked major turning points in the climate and therefore turning points in the tasks of the people. Right? You see, these days most people do the same job throughout the year, not so in the past. Each season had its own pageant of jobs that you would have to carry out. Now these four important days were the two solstices and the two equinoxes. Right? Now solstice means the sun standing still, all right? Uh, and this is because, I have to say where people, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, yes, well, it does on two days of the year, the two equinoxes, okay? <laughs> uh, and what you would find is the rise and set position of the sun is continually moving along the horizon. And that's what people really get surprised at when they come out to Stonehenge. And they stand out there and you've got these stones marking where the sun rises or sets at the solstices and equinoxes. And they notice how big a difference there is of where the sun rises or sets uh, at the su either summer, winter, spring and autumn and so on. They do know because they know the, the sun comes in different windows in their house. They just don't realise. It's when you walk it at Stonehenge that it suddenly crystallises in your mind. Mm, that's right. Mm. And of course, our, our ancestors would have been very, very aware of that. As I said, solstice means the sun standing still, and that's exactly what it does. It marches, the rise or set position of the sun marches along the horizon until it gets to the, what we call the solstice position, the longest or the shortest day. It stops, turns around and goes back again. Equinox, as I said, means equal day, equal night. It's when the sun is above the horizon for exactly 12 hours around the world, okay? And it is, incidentally, as I said, the only time of the year when the sun rises due east and sets due west, okay? So just bear that in mind if you were ever uh, going out uh, <laughs> tramping or whatever, uh, east and west and that and times are all going to vary. It's okay? easterly, but yeah. not east. That's True right. East. That's right. And those four days became great festivals which were celebrated throughout the ancient world. They were the original holy days or God's days or goddess days. Right? And that's where your word holiday comes from because no one would work on a holy day. And of course, in those days, the only days you probably got off was a holy day, wasn't it? Life was a little bit more difficult than what we've got today. All right, now the most important of all those days was the spring equinox. And here we're talking about the Northern Hemisphere. It marked the return of life on Earth following the harsh Northern Hemisphere winter, the restoration of food supplies, the lambing season. This was certainly a time to celebrate. Now we call that great festival Easter, all right? Now, of course, if you've been brought up in a Christian society, you immediately identify Easter as a Christian festival. But uh, we'll question that in a moment. You see, something else I always like to mention about when we're talking about antiquity is something I learned when I was at university, when I did um, uh, looking at that back into the past and that. And, uh, well, there's this thing called ethnocentrism, right? It works this way. When we're at school or whatever, we learn all about our own culture, virtually nothing about anybody else's culture, and we think our culture is superior to everybody else's culture. And essentially everybody thinks exactly the same way. So as most of you will probably know, I was brought up in England. Uh, when I went to school, I uh, learned all about English history. Absolutely nothing about the French or Germans, except when we were fighting them. New Zealand. All I knew of New Zealand was when Mum used to take me into a butcher shop and there was this meat that had New Zealand stamped on it. Oh, some distant country with sheep living on it. And that's all I learnt about New Zealand. I learnt at school all about Christianity 
absolutely nothing about Islam or Hinduism or any other religion. And it's not often until this is pointed out to you, you realise how narrowly focused you are in the things that you learn. Right? But of course, once we start dealing with the stars, we keep crossing over from one culture to another. So when I said the Easter, you would immediately think of Easter as a Christian festival. But have you ever wondered what Easter bunnies and Easter eggs have got to do with it? The answer is nothing because we've been celebrating Easter thousands of years before the coming of Christianity. As I said, it marked the spring equinox. The word Easter comes from Eostri, who was the Teutonic goddess of fertility. I think I've got a little picture of her coming up here, right? Beautiful goddess, okay? Um, her Easter eggs was her gift to the people. The hens started laying again after the long winter, and the Easter bunny... Well, that was her symbol of fertility. And any farm in this air will tell you it's a very potent symbol as the bunny rabbit. So next time you see the Easter bunny, just remember what it's symbolising. It's, it's not what you think it is, is it, Kay? No. Nope. Okay. So, so, but I, I look, I'd like to tell you something else. While we're looking at this lovely lady, for those of you who can see her on TV, here, here's another bit of ethnocentrism. If I, we talk about the Creator, you immediately think of He. God. But in fact, in the ancient religions and most of human history, the supreme being in the universe, the creator, was not he. It was she for most of human history. And this makes good sense when you think about it. It's the female that brings life into the world. So if there was a creator, wouldn't it be a she? But it's more important that also. When you were a little kid and you fell over and hurt yourself, who did you run to? You run to your mum. And that caring figure that's going to look after you, no matter how naughty you've been, has endured down through time. Also, when you see um, movies set in, uh, whether it's set in medieval times and you see a battle, you only ever see men on the battlefield? Well, that's not true either. Amongst the Celts, for example, all women were warriors. You've also heard of Bodicea, or Bodica, right, as she's called. Well, she wasn't unusual. All of her sisters were warriors as well. So you've all seen Xena on TV. She's actually closer to the truth. Now, this has all changed when two, I have to say it whether you like it or not, two patriarchal religions came in and took over. That's Christianity and Islam. And what happened is that women were banned and chucked out of all their offices in the uh, religion. And it's actually just recently, actually, after Neon... You know, over a thousand years that the Catholic Church is now allowing women once again to become priests. Right? So women were chucked out of their religious positions and they were also banned from bearing arms or training in martial arts. Right? So what would happen, of course, if someone insulted a woman, she had to get her knight in shining armour to defend her honour, while in the old days she just pulled out her sword and sorted it out herself. And you've got to remember, when you look at weapons, folks, when we're talking about a sword or a bow, it's dexterity and speed rather than physical strength, which is the important thing. So a woman well-trained is just as deadly as a man. So something to bear in mind when we look at how our portray of history of what is truth and what isn't and so on, OK? OK, so that's uh, Eostri who's there. Winter solstice. I won't go into this because we can into into detail because we can do all about it later stage. I uh, just brought up Father Christmas. Have you ever wondered who who Father Christmas was? I tell you what, it's a bit horrifying. <laughs> but we'll we'll tell you all of that about, about that later. And you immediately think of the as of uh, Father Christmas and Christmas Day as the birth of Jesus, but it wasn't. Uh, Jesus, it was a, December the 25th was the date of the winter solstice, adopted by a Christian emperor in the year 350, 356 AD. Okay, so that's not when Jesus was born. But we'll go into all those stories at a later state when we get a bit closer to Christmas, to what they were originally all about. Okay, now, finally, we'll just we'll briefly finish off. Uh, we're looking at our night sky in the uh, looking north. And we've also got that big bright object in the sky, which is the planet Jupiter. And due north, uh, so in the early evening, we've got, Ju uh, we've got Orion. All right? 
And I, last time, I think I showed you how to use Orion as a signpost. So we come down the belt of Orion and we come to Aldebaran, which is the uh, big bright star in the sky, um, all important in the constellation of Taurus the Bull and the Hyades star cluster around it. Then if we carry on from there, we come to the Pleiades, which are in fact the most famous star cluster in the world. All right. And the reason for that is if here we are, we just brought them up, the Pleiades. It's a cluster of about 400, but there's about six or seven that can be seen, uh, uh, six, seven, eight or nine that can be seen with the unaided eye. Uh, they're also known as the four pillars of heaven or part of the four pillars of heaven. There were originally four bright stars. I better turn that back on again. There we go. There were four bright stars which marked exactly where the sun was at a solstice or an equinox. And these four stars were four, bound round by four constellations and they were known as the four pillars of heaven. The most important pillar was in fact or Deborah, okay, uh, not sorry, Aldebaran. it's the one who's in, in Taurus the Bull. There they are there, or Deborah, Regulus, Antares, and Fomalhaut in those four star signs. But it was, or Deborah was the most important because it marked the spring equinox, the beginning of the year, and the opening of the sea lanes. But of course, you couldn't see it because when the sun was next to Aldebaran, it was in the daytime. But what our ancestors could see was this as the sun moved to Aldebaran, the tail of the bull popped up above the horizon. That tip of the bull's tail, all right, is the Pleiades star cluster, all right, and there it is there. And so the sighting of the Pleiades star cluster, also known as the Seven Sisters, herald the beginning of the new year. All right, there's the Seven Sisters there. We'll talk about these stars in much greater detail at a later stage, all right. And from about 5,000 years ago, the rising of the Seven Sisters marked the begin for people around the world, marked the op beginning of the year or, and also the opening of the sea lanes. It was time to sail again. Right? They're also known as the Head and Chicks, the Sailor Stars, for that particular reason, because when the, when the Pleiades were above the horizon, it was safe to sail. Four and a half thousand years ago, however, the migrations into the Pacific began and the people travelling into the Pacific carried this star law with them, okay? From down here, they're around the other way, we know these stars as Matariki, which means little eyes. And so that's where that tradition <coughs> comes from. So to this day, Maori say, the rising of Matariki heralds the beginning of the year. I keep on saying heralds, okay, because actually they, they are the herald, but then what they would look for is the moon. And once the, and I'll tell you more of this in detail at a later stage about the crescent moon and the year would begin at full moon. But we'll talk all about that at a later date. Okay, we'll go into the, some of the stories behind the moon and the way in which it was used, which you, I think you're also going to find quite interesting, aren't you? The period of misrule, okay? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does exist in other cultures as well. Yes, yes. Well, we'll talk about that when mm. we've got a little bit more time, OK? Uh, so there you are. So do go out and have a look, folks. If the sky's clear, probably you almost certainly be clear tonight. Remember, go down the belt of Orion through to Aldebaran and to the Pleiades. So identify that most important of star clusters. Just to finish off now, um, Stonehenge is open at the moment from Wednesday to Sunday. All right, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if you want to come out and visit us and have a look at some of these things. And also, just to also mention that in March, we've got Dave Flynn coming out for the Celtic guitar, guitar journey. And so you, what you can do is just book up uh, on our web page or phone through to Kay. Anyway, folks, I'm going to shut up now and uh, catch up with you again soon.